Oh hey, it's Wes, and today I want to talk about my microphone. I've been using this, the Godox WMic S1, for quite some time now for a variety of applications, and it's time to really go over how it holds up and how it works out. So let's get into it. The WMic S1 is a UHF mic pack, comes in stereo, you can also buy a mono pack of it as well. And this thing is powered by two AA batteries as a convenient slide out pack. The uh, receiver has two antennas, the transmitter has one antenna, and it has auto pairing, auto channel lock. Let's jump right into it, starting with the build quality. The build of this is, honestly, it looks better than it feels. This is a very light and plasticky build. You've got some uh, dingly dangly antennas on here, which I don't know how breakable those are going to be. The screen is very small, reasonably easy to read though, and it has a nice hard plastic cover that doesn't seem to scratch all that easily. And I have a pretty standard belt clip on the back here. Got USB-C power on the side, in case that's something that you need. Let's go into some accessories here. Whoop, got our microphone. The biggest problem that I have with this microphone is this clip is gigantic. I mean, you can see it on my shirt here. It takes up a lot of space. I took the foamy off of it to try to make it a little bit smaller, but this is a huge mic. Now, initially I thought that this was going to be the same mic that comes with a lot of generic microphones. It's a very familiar mic capsule, this one right here, but I don't believe that it is. So if I take the protector off this one, you can see that these are actually slightly different microphones. They are similar in size, but they're not the same. So this mic capsule on the side here, this comes with everything from uh, the iRay to the Comica Boom X. And this one, however, I have not seen on anything else. Also, the wire on the mic, it's a little bit stiff, a little bit rubbery, a little bit big. And if we compare this to what's kind of the gold standard for this category, here is the, the mic that comes with the Rode Wireless Go. It is minuscule, very tiny. The clip, a nice appropriate size, pretty small. And the wire, very flexible and incredibly thin, just disappears. So I'm gonna give that a build quality of seven out of 10. Feature set. One of the main features of this for me is the battery life. This thing will go and go for a long time. On their website, Godox didn't have a specific battery life listed and so I tested it myself. Well, I would anyway. And I tested for eight hours and I ran out of time and had to go pick up my kids from daycare and came back about an hour later after some errands and it had died. So it was somewhere between eight and nine hours that I got on it, which is phenomenal. And then you can easily change out the batteries. This is a pretty standard size. It's not ultra compact like some that we've seen. Here is another UHF device. This is the Seven Rims iRay, works great. <laughs> Obviously it is a very different size. So this is made to be a very familiar device to people. You have a full display on both the transmitter and the receiver. However, the displays are a little bit small compared to the text that shows up on them. You have USB-C power, you have UHF transmission, which can be a great boon for transmission, and you can use them in either stereo or mono modes. But we don't have built-in microphones like we do on a lot of modern devices these days. But then again, this is so big, like you're not gonna click this, clip this onto your lapel. So that's not a huge miss. But overall, with screens on both sides, lots of ins and outs, you got output, headphones, mic, line in, you've got quarter 20s on all of them, you've got AA batteries that can be swapped out easy. Overall, that's a great feature set to have. It's just a little bit big compared to some offerings these days, so I'm gonna give that a nine out of 10. Bonus feature is this case. Most cases I wouldn't use because they're bigger than they need to be, or they're kind of weird looking, too flashy. This one is a beautiful, subtle case. It's hard, nice finish, subtle Godox logo, got your pockets, protector. Really like this case, I've actually been using it. I don't know how long I'll use it for because generally I start using cases and then eventually I just throw things in my bag. 
So that's a feature set, 9 out of 10. Sound quality. This is one where I was very surprised. You're already hearing my sound right now, so you can make your own judgments, but for me, the unedited version of this sound is fantastic. It is second only to my favorite sound quality win for this category, the Hollyland Lark 150. These ones sound phenomenal. They can be just a tiny bit scratchy if you get a bit too loud, that's the only downside, but these found, sounds fantastic. I thought this would have a generic sound to it. It does not, it sounds great to my ear, and it's a little bit malleable as well. It tends to get a little bit peaky when you're too loud. Am I too loud right now? Am I getting a bit peaky? I might be. So, could still stand to have a slightly better roll off. I'm gonna give that a nine out of 10 for sound quality. It's great, especially at this price point, which we'll talk about more later. Usability, and as you know, with my mic tests, the number one usability feature for one of these is transmission reliability, signal strength. So let's go outside and give that a try. So now it's time for our range test. We have the Seven Rims iRay. If that hasn't been released yet, it will be soon. I've made a video on that ages ago in the winter, but uh, still waiting regulatory approval. And our Godox, RX-1. There we go, both pointing the same direction. Got some 35 millimeters. Pop up on the screen which side is which. All hooked up the same way. Let's go for a walk. Okay, here we are at a fairly normal distance. I believe this, everything should be working just fine this far away. And if I turn around, turning around, I'm turning around. Let's see if anything changes while I am turning around. I have the mics on opposite hips, so they shouldn't blank out at the same time, but I also don't want them to be right on top of each other because that would be a little bit unfair. They would cause interference with one another because they are both UHF. So now I'm behind just a little bit of wood. Got a drain pipe here. Turning around while I'm back here. Turning around. See if anything changes there. And now let's go for a little bit of a walk. So at this distance here, I would consider this a pretty normal distance to be filming a wedding ceremony from. So let's say there's an officiant and the people getting married, they would be about this far away from me. And so if someone were to turn around, let's say they're giving the ring or something, then this is just something that would happen. I can't control whether people are facing me at all times or not. And so you have to want to know whether or not this is going to be reliable. So let's continue on. Things are a little damp out here, so I'm going to have to take a bit of a circuitous path. I should have worn my big rubber boots, but I did not. I guess I was a bit optimistic. Oh, you might be able to hear the squishing under my feet. I have a bit of a drainage problem back here, but uh, in these COVID times, it's not much of a priority. Okay, <clears throat> so here I am back here. What one might consider to be the reasonable limit of range, so let's do a turn. We're doing a bit of a turn. Now on my last mic test, I went about five feet further back, in case you were wondering, but I can't get a little bit further back because I would be up past my ankles in slush. So that is what it is. But we're pretty close right here. Well, I'm far from you, but we're close to the farthest practical distance. Whoop, okay, let's head on back. Coming back. Again, these are both UHF systems, so they shouldn't be very prone to interference, except among each other. And speaking of interference, there is very little interference in this neighborhood right here. I can only see two Wi-Fi hotspots from where we are right now, and even then, they're not very strong. But they wouldn't interfere with what we're doing here anyway, so that's no big deal. Not a lot going on here. And now for the final test, we're going to go behind some metal. There is a Honda Civic behind these cameras. So here we go. We are standing behind the Honda Civic. So both my hips are just behind the hood. Sorry, not the hood, the trunk or the boot, depending on where you live. Now we're ducking down. Now I am sitting behind the Honda Civic, about 12 to 15 feet behind the cameras. Is it going to work? Because they're not pointed in the right direction. I don't know. Now I'm turning around behind the Civic, and we are coming back. And there you have it. So, how did that do? I have no idea. Let's find out. Have a listen. So that's fantastic. 
Against the iRay, which is a deceptively powerful transmitter, this did great, very solid. So obviously that's a big win. You've got backup USB-C power, reasonably easy to use system. So let's talk about that a bit more. So if I press this menu button, nothing happens. I have to press it and hold it. There we go. And that lets me turn the receiver off and on. It lets me choose the channels, lets me change the volume. It doesn't let me change the frequency that I'm on, however, which is unfortunate. And the menu button isn't really a menu. It just lets you edit this particular screen that you're on, which is odd. So if you're on a screen, you can press and hold that button and then make a change to it. Now, the problem with this, it's really slow to use. It's almost problematically slow. So this has its ups and downs. So what I see is this is designed for a more professional setting where your talent has this on them and you do not want them to screw it up. So you press these volume up and down buttons, nothing happens. You can press the power button quickly to mute on my end. Here we are. And now I am not. And so on the transmitter end here, I can choose my power output level if I go into the setting, my backlight settings, not a lot of options, my group number, channel number, high power, low power. I cannot change my volume. So to change the volume on this, you have to go into the menu. You have to click to the right screen, to the right channel, and then you hold down a button, then you navigate to the volume level and then you change the volume. This is a pain in the butt. Compared to on the Hollyland Lark, let's get a channel out here. I have channel one, channel two. And look at this. As soon as I turn this knob that is not on my talent, it's just sitting on top of the camera, it alters my volume level. It is so fast and easy. The Lark doesn't even really have a menu system because it makes everything so simple. Then on the transmitter here, you just have a little mute button. That's it. Hold it down for power, charge it in the case, boom. So that is a very high standard to compete against for usability. Although this has its positives, that you can swap out the battery easily and you have that fantastic UHF signal connection, I can't give this more than an eight out of 10 for usability. I love that we have both screens, screens on every device, but the implementation just isn't fantastic. And if you look at this screen, we have a lot of pixels, but they're not really used to great effect. That was very nitpicky. It's still great to use, but uh, it's not perfect. It has more potential. Moving on to the last category, value. So there are some other compact transmitters like this. Uh, the Movo WX20 Duo comes to mind. That's $200 doesn't have nearly as good signal strength or sound quality as this. Very easy to use and simple though. So this one comes in at 250. You can get the model version for 180. The cheapest thing that we can do in this field is again, the Sokani Tiny, which is 170 bucks. Not that much cheaper. And then there is Comica Boom XU. That gives us UHF, kind of a weird build quality. And it's $250. It's the same price. Not as good signal strength as this. Doesn't have the screens these have. Ceramonic has uh, some products from uh, $250 to $400. The one that directly competes with this is probably closer to $400. We have the Hollyland Lark, $150. That's $330. So you get some cool stuff, but you're paying more for that. Then you have what's probably the most direct competitor to this is the Deity Connect Dual. That's $670. Very similar products. And then there is the most ubiquitous competitor to this, the Rode Wireless Go 2 two-man kit, which comes in at 300 bucks. Still more, very tiny though, has some cool features. So overall, I do have to give this a nine out of 10 for value. It's not the cheapest thing you, you can get to get the job done, but in its class, it's really hard to beat. So overall, that gives us a 42 out of 50. Pretty solid score, not a perfect product, but when I need a signal that is bang on and will not fail me, this is the one that I'm going to be reaching for from here on out. I have had great luck with the road, unlike some people, but uh, as great as the Hollyland Lark 150 is, as convenient and easy to use, 
the signal strength is not even close. And yes, it's not the same frequency, this is 2.4 gigahertz, but there are lots of 2.4 gigahertz devices that are even better than this for signal strength. So anyway, if you have any questions about this or if you want to buy one of these, check out down below in the description or in the comments. I have links to help support this channel and feed my fat cats. So until next time, let me know what you think about the sound of this, and we'll go take some photos.